get after it. Well, listen, I'm excited about getting after what God has put on my heart today. So open up your Bibles. Go to Luke chapter 18. We're going to be looking at verses 35 through 43. So Luke 18, 35 through 43. Uh, and so as you're doing that, turn to the people next to you and say, Jesus looks good on me today. Jesus looks good on me. You guys are quick and quiet, right? This is awesome. Well, Luke, Luke chapter 18, if you got to say amen. amen. If you need a minute, say give me a minute. Good. Let's stand up as we read God's word today. Uh, that's what we do to honor his word. And so, Father, we just uh, ask you to move in us. And so, uh, starting at verse 35, it says this. As he approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the road begging. And hearing the crowd passing by, he inquired what was happening. Jesus of Nazareth is passing by, they told him. So he called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then those in front of him, uh, those in front of, in front told him to keep quiet. But he kept crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. And when he came closer, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, he said, I want to see. Receive your sight, Jesus told him. Your faith has saved you. Instantly, say instantly. Instantly, instantly he could see. And he began to follow him, glorifying God. All the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Lord, we sure do love you. We thank you, Father, for how you move in our lives. And Father, we pray, God, that you would just move in this room. That you just, Holy Spirit, that you just sweep through it. That you just have your way. Father, I ask that you would just uh, open up our eyes, Father, so that we can see your word more clearly. And I ask that you open our ears, Lord, so we can hear your word more clearly. And I ask that you open our hearts, Lord, so we can feel your word more clearly. God, just have your way. Speak into us. We love you. And we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As you have a seat, turn to three people and say, there is hope. There is hope. My favorite movie, if I was to do any kind of superhero movie, my favorite superhero is Superman. I love Superman. And there's a movie out there called The Man of Steel. You ever see that movie? If you haven't, go check it out, okay? During this movie, uh, Superman is arrested. And he's sitting in this interrogation room. And inside this interrogation room, he is being interrogated by um, Lois Lane. And Lois Lane is just, they're just having this conversation. And in the, in the middle of this conversation, she stops and she says, hey, what does the S stand for on your chest? And he says, well, that's not an S. You see, that is a symbol of hope on my planet. The symbol of hope. When we were thinking about living water, and God gave me the plan or the vision of living water, I called a buddy of mine who is uh, a graphic art designer. And I asked him, I said, listen, I, I told him the whole vision, right? This is maybe two months into it. And I said, here's the vision that God has given me. And he wants me to call it living water, right? Living water comes from John chapter four where Jesus met the woman at the well. And I said, I want you to come up with a symbol, right? And he says, what are you thinking about? I said, I'm not thinking about anything. I want to know what you think about when you hear this, right? So he has a team of people. And he gave me a, a, a ton of uh, logos, a ton of stuff. And this is the one that hit me the most. And I told him, I said, his name is Vance. I said, Vance, um, here's what I want. I, I want. I want something that represents living water. Of course, it says living water, community church on the bottom. But all I want is a logo that when it goes out into the community, when people see this logo, they'll know that that's a place of love. They'll know that that's a place of joy, that this is a place of hope. And I said, and uh, that's all I want. That's all I want. And when you go out into the community now and people see this raindrop, we're five years into this, 
But when people see this raindrop, they instantly think about this church. And when I say this church, I'm not talking about this building. I'm talking about you. And when they, they easily see this and they think about you, and there are folks, when we go out and partner up with our partners like Habitat for Humanity, we set in this meeting full of just a bunch of people in the city, uh, planners and business owners and, and CEOs and all that stuff. And here we are sitting there, and we're going around the table introducing ourselves. And instantly I said, well, I'm Jason, I'm the pastor of Living Water Community Church. And the people of Habitat said this. They said, listen, all you have to do is call living water and they'll come. I said, God, I want people when they see this, I want them to see hope. That's what I want them to see. If we look at the word hope, it means to desire something with confident expectation of its fulfillment. Another word for hope means desire. Say desire. desire. Expectation. Say expectation. expectation. Longing. Say longing. Right? So hope, desire, expectation, longing, a desire uh, to desire something with confident expectation to fulfillment. Let's jump into the scripture, verses 35 through 38. And let's keep this up here for just a minute. Let's jump into it, right? So, uh, oh no, let's go back to the, go, go to the uh, other one. There you go, right there. So it says this, it goes, as he approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the road begging. Hearing a crowd passing by, he inquired what was happening. They said, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by, they told him. So he says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, why did I say it that loud? Because there's an exclamation point at the end of that sentence. Right? That's He was crying out, to the, to the Lord. We know in Mark chapter 10 that this story, they give his name is Bartimaeus. So there's this man who is a beggar, and his name is Bartimaeus. Now here's what would happen. These, these beggars, whether they be uh, blind or, or deaf or whatever, what they, are, what they would do, or maybe they were crippled, they would, they would uh, wait along the roads near the cities because that was where they could uh, contact the most people. What does that mean? Well, usually disabled in some way, beggars are unable to earn a living. So they would they would basically have to just sit there and people would give to them, whether it be food or a denarii or if they had that, right? So medical help was not available to these folks, these beggars, right? These people who, who had uh, problems. And what would happen is people would uh, tend to ignore their obligation to care for the needy. They would not see them. They would not pass them by. They would ignore them. They wouldn't help them out. They're just, they're just a nuisance. They're just in the way. What does that mean? They, they avoided the obligation to care for the needy. Well, Leviticus 25, 35 through 38 says this. This is the obligation that they put out there. It says this. If your brother becomes destitute and cannot sustain himself among you, listen, you are to support him as an alien or temporary resident, so that he can continue to live among you. Do not profit or take interest from him, but fear your God and let your brother live among you. You are not to lend him your silver with interest or sell him your food for profit. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. These folks actually ignored this command from the Lord. They ignored the part of that you're supposed to support these people. Uh, and, and so help them to continue to live among them. And they just ignored them. Can I ask you something? Is that still happening today? Yep. Yes. Come on, church. Can we get real right now? Yep. Still happening today. Don't we have people better sitting at, on, on, in the cities and just begging for help and begging for food or begging for assistance? And, and don't, sometimes we just ignore them. Now, I'm not saying that there are people out there, uh, I do believe that there are people out there abusing the system. I believe that. But it's still happening today, right? And so here's the thing, these beggars, these folks on the side of the street, those who are just sitting in, in hopelessness, here they are, they had little hope of escaping their degrading way of life. But Bartimaeus, in desperation, 
He calls out. Now I want you to listen to what he says. Right? He says, Jesus, son of David. When he says Jesus, son of David, he is actually recognizing that he is the Messiah. And here's the thing. Just because he was blind and ignored and struggling and desperate and frustrated with the situation, it doesn't mean that he didn't hear the stories of Jesus. It doesn't mean that he uh, didn't hear about the miracles of Jesus or that he didn't know who Jesus was at all. But with all that he could muster up, he called out to Jesus in hope that he would hear him. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I wonder if he's like, I wonder if he heard me. Because he can't tell. He can't see. I don't know if he heard me or not. But he's crying out to him. Listen, no matter how desperate your situation may seem, if you call out to Jesus in faith, he will help you. Lord, I need your help. I need your touch. I need you to see me. I need you to hear me. I need, I need your help with my circumstances. Father, bring my prodigal child back home. Father, protect them while they are away. Remove this desire of my addiction from my mouth and my mind. I need your help in mending my broken marriage. Father, remove this bitterness that is poisoning. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Can anybody relate to this? I guess the question I'm asking is, are you crying out to Jesus like that? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. In the middle of your circumstances, in the middle of what's happening in your life, Bartimaeus couldn't even see. And he's crying out in hope that Jesus would hear him. <clears throat> Listen to what Psalm 42.5 says. It says, why, my soul, are you so dejected? Why are you in so much turmoil? Put your hope in God. Say, put your hope in God. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, put your hope in God. <laughs> and say, I mean it this time. <laughs> put your hope in God, for I will still praise him, my Savior and my God. Listen, put your hope in God and still praise him. Turn to your neighbor and say, there is hope. There is hope. Verse 39, let's check it out. Go to verse 39. Here we go. Verse 39 says this. Then those in front told him to keep quiet. But he kept crying out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. This man, Bartimaeus, who cannot see, who is probably in the back of the crowd as Jesus is coming in, he cries out a second time because people are telling him, be quiet. You're going to bother Jesus. He doesn't need to hear you. Can't you see that he's busy? You know, when I was reading this, I wondered, as they were telling him to be quiet, I was wondering if they, if the crowd started pushing him aside, right? I wonder if they pushed him back further and further from Jesus. But it didn't stop him, right? They said, you need to be quiet. No, he kept crying out all the more. I wonder if he's in the back. I don't know, maybe Jesus is here. He can't see, right? So I wonder if he's jumping, right? I don't know how tall Bartimaeus is. I don't know if he was short. I don't know if he was tall. But I wonder if he was jumping. Jesus! Jesus, son of David. I wonder if he's like, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I gotta get to him. I gotta get to him. I don't care what anybody else is going to do. Listen, he wasn't going to be shut down that quickly. And he wasn't going to go quietly either. Listen, I, I believe that there are some of us here who are being told by the enemy. And even maybe someone in your camp, maybe someone in your family, or maybe someone you know, that they're telling you that Jesus is too busy for you. Listen, he can't hear you. Stop bothering him. I'm pretty sure they're saying, uh -oh, the devil's saying, what's the point? He hasn't done anything for you yet. What makes you think he's going to start listening to you now? But I know that hope is a powerful thing. And if you've been clinging on to hope for a while now, or maybe most of your life, maybe it's time to shout louder over that negativity in your life. Maybe you need to jump higher than those who are trying to push you down. Right? Maybe it's time for you to project your voice a little bit louder into your situation. Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. 
Because I'll tell you what, hope doesn't retreat. Hope doesn't surrender. Hope doesn't give up. Hope doesn't take, or hope takes that next step. Hope drives the next mile. Hope clings on to the last minute. Hope is a powerful, or is powerful beyond measure. When our son Jacob was born, Jacob was born with complications. Long story short, Jacob was born with paralyzed vocal cords, right? He's usually sitting right here, but he's not, but pretend he is. <laughs> Jacob was born with paralyzed vocal cords. What does that mean? That means that he can get air out, but he can't get air in. And when he came out, he blew all the air out. Like he was like, Whoa! and went quiet. And for 40 to 45 minutes, the doctors and the nurses were actually doing CPR on her son. And they kept saying, bag him, start CPR. They're trying to intubate him, get a tube down him, right? I'm listening to my son die on the, on the table. And I'm a mess. Because who wants to hear that? So finally, they're able to uh, intubate him, right? Get a tube in there so he can breathe. It took about 40, 45 minutes. He, they rush him down to uh, University of Colorado Hospital. And he's in there for like a whole month. We couldn't even touch him for a whole month. He's like in this little incubator thing. He was born premature, 35 weeks, uh, four days. And we couldn't touch him. Here we are, Trudy and I, right? And, and Trudy had to stay in the hospital an extra day. I'm, I'm chasing the ambulance down. And if anybody knows who I am, I am, I am uh, directionally challenged. <laughs> I knew I had to go south. I knew that, right? And I, and I got, and I, I got on the wrong highway. Uh, and I'm calling Colorado. Hey, man, where are you? And they're like, where are you? And I was like, now entering Montana. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> But I get to the hospital and here we are for like a, a whole month. Trudy and I can't touch him. We're in this gigantic room, the Nick unit, right? And there's about maybe 12, 13 babies in there. And Jacob's just in there. And they would pull the tube out and he couldn't breathe and they put the tube back in. And every time he couldn't breathe, Jacob's dying, right? The doctors and nurses are stumped. They can't figure it out. And so my mom and dad come and visit us. Right, my dad. My dad is a Christian man. So awesome. I just miss him. So my dad walks in, and he sees all the stuff. And if you know my dad, right? My dad was a pastor, but he was a mechanic uh, by trade beforehand. And, and you know, Jacob's hooked up on all these machines. And <laughs> my dad's not interested in Jake. He's in. How does this machine work? What if you took this apart? Right? What if you unplug this? We're like, Dad, don't stop. What are you doing? Don't touch those things. He's asking doctors. So what is this doing? What's what's the android or the uh, gigawatt power or whatever, right? And so and we're just like, what's up? So finally, they were able to move Jacob into the room. Remember, we can't touch him. And so we're in this room, and so. Uh, there's there's like no hope here. Doctors and nurses are stumped. We're stumped. God, I don't even know why I'm so emotional about this right now. Anyhow. So my dad says, he grabs his anointing oil and he anoints Jacob. And us, the doctors, specialists, nurses, everybody, we all grab hands and start praying around Jacob's bed. One week later, they figured out, hey, we got to get them to the Children's Hospital. In fact, those doctors at Children's Hospital are so sneaky. They know how to take care of insurance stuff. They said, listen, we got to get them to Children's Hospital. Listen, our insurance won't cover up. Listen, insurance isn't open on the weekend. We'll take them on Saturday. <laughs> and they took them. Hallelujah. One week, they figured it out. They had to, they had to put a trach inside of Jake. As a father, you stare at him, right? I just stared at my son the night before they put a trach in it, right? Because that's the only time he'll be whole. After this, he's going to have wholeness from And then two weeks after that, he went home. He went home. Now you look at him, he's 21 years old. And because of the lack of oxygen, he has a mild case of cerebral palsy that affects his right side, right? He's got hydrocephalus, that's water on the brain. He's got degenerative lung disease, 
right? He's got scoliosis, right? Doctors are like, man, you'd be lucky if he makes it to 20. He's 21. Doctors told us that when he was young, that he would never be able to walk. He would never be able to talk. I don't know if you ever see him, but he walks out of here and he'll talk to you. Yep. 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 In fact, we actually, we removed his vocal cords. If you don't have any vocal cords, you can't speak. Right, your vocal cords are what causes your the vibration of your voice. Right, and we shaved one side. We're like just removed it. We sewed the other part of the vocal cord to the side of his throat, so he could have an open airway. He took out his tonsils and the amyloids. We want that trach out so that he can live a semi normal life. <laughs> if you don't have a hand, you can't have a hand again. We took his voice away, and he'll talk to you. You tell me that there's no hope. You tell me that God does not do miracles. You tell me that God just sits on the throne and doesn't intercede, and I'll introduce you to Jacob. Because my God's still alive. And my God still does miracles. And my God is still full of hope. And we need to start putting our hope into him. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Turn to your neighbor and say, there is hope. There is hope. Psalm 62, 5 through 6 says this, Rest in God alone, my soul, for my hope comes from Him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I will not be shaken. Verse 40 through 43, right? And then, uh, and then I, I say we're done. <laughs> <I'll just kidding. laughs> okay. So he calls out twice. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. What does Jesus do? It's right here. I, I just put it right up here. What did Jesus do? <laughs> Come on, church. Can you, do we need to make the font bigger? <laughs> Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. What did Jesus do? Stop. He stopped. He heard Bartimaeus. Just keep this, just keep this on the screen. He heard Bartimaeus, right? He probably saw the commotion. He maybe even witnessed a crowd trying to keep Bartimaeus quiet. But Jesus stopped. And then what did he do? Jesus stopped and he commanded that he be brought to him. And I'm pretty sure Bartimaeus was like, get me to him. People had to guide him. To Jesus, right? Because he can't see, right? So he's been heard. Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, stop. Wait a minute. Something just happened. I just heard somebody's plea. I just heard somebody's cry. I just heard somebody praying. I just heard someone kneeling at their bed. I just heard somebody calling out my name. Bring them to me. Bring them to me. And they guided him to them. I wonder if there are any folks here today sitting in this room, sitting under the sound of my voice that need to be guided to Jesus because you're spiritually blind. Right? I mean, you've heard about Jesus. You probably even picked up the book and maybe read two or three pages. Maybe you attend church or you sing the songs, but you're still walking around blind to what the Lord is doing and we're paying more attention to what the world is doing. But Jesus asked this very simple question, right? He asked a simple question. He says to him, what do you want me to do? <laughs> what do you want me to do for you? And, and, and I want you to see what, how he replies. He says, I, I want to see. Jesus says, what can I do for you? Notice Notice that he didn't say, well, Lord, this is what happened in my life when I was 12 and I was 13, right? Um, he didn't talk about how the people treated him in the past and how they ignored him, right? Or how frustrated he got. He just said, Father, I just want to see. Four simple words said it all to Jesus. He says, I want to see. And in those four simple words, it was like Bartimaeus was saying, I know you can fix this. He is saying, I know you can heal me. 
And when you do fix this, and when you do heal me, not he didn't say if. He didn't say, Lord, if you can do it, I want to see. No, he didn't say if or when. He said, oh yeah, he said, he says, when you do this, all that other stuff that happened in my life, it doesn't matter anymore. It don't matter anymore. And listen to what Jesus said. He says, I want to see. And Jesus says, all right, receive your sight. And what happened? What's the next word? Here, I'll point it out to you. What's the next word? What, what, how, how did it happen? Did it happen a minute later? No. Did it happen? Did he have to rub some dirt on his eyes? No. no. Did he have to go make it happen? No. no. He says, I want to see. He said, receive your sight. He saw. What man saw, he could see. And he became one of Jesus' followers. And he began to follow Jesus and to begin to glorify him, right? Not, not once did he turn around and, and he said, all right, which one of you are the one who told me to be quiet? Someone speak up. I know your voice. I know it. Right? I'm pretty sure he didn't turn around and say, oh, okay, who's the one that pushed me? Who's the one that pushed, pushed me down? Right? What's <laughs> up? I don't think he did that, right? No, he just said, hallelujah, I can see. I'm following the one who touched my body, who touched my eyes, so that I can see. I'm going to keep going. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And because of that, because of this man who was ignored and who was filled with frustration, who was pushed to the back of the bus, who was ignored, who was begging just for someone to take care of him, but the people who now see him in a different light continue to follow Jesus and worship him as well. Because this man can see, because the power of Jesus, they said, I want to follow him too. Amen. I told you it was going to be good today. <laughs> Psalm 147, 10 through 11 says this. He is not impressed by the strength of a horse. He does not value the power of a warrior. The Lord values those who fear him, those who put their hope in his faithful love. My question to you is, who do you put your hope in? Romans 12, 12 says this, Rejoice in hope. Be patient in affliction. Be persistent in prayer. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. Hope is here today. I can feel him. And hope has a name. And his name is Jesus. Romans 8, 24, 25 says this. Now in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is not hope. Let me read that to you again. But hope that is seen is not hope. Because hope, who hopes for what he sees? Now if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with what? Patience. Anybody patient in here today? Anybody impatient? Father, where are you? <laughs> right? Come on now. Your situation, Lord, where are you? I've been dealing with this my entire life. Not once do you hear Jacob ever say in his 21 years of life, why am I different? You know what my father once said to me? He says, Jason, do you think that when Jacob looks at us, he wonders why we're not normal. <laughs> That's deep. <laughs> we are all not normal in Jacob's eyes. Now, if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait with it. Wait for it with what? Jesus. Hebrews ten twenty three. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering. Patience without wavering. Since he who promised is faithful. Do you believe God is faithful? Yes. Do you believe that he is listening to you? Yes. Do you believe he hears you? Yes. Yeah. What makes you think he hasn't stopped in your situation? What makes you think he hasn't commanded you already to come forward? He sees you. He hears you. He knows you. He knows your name. A couple of years back, a couple of Christmas Eve service Eve back, we had this gentleman who came in to the depot center, kind of towards the middle of it. 
And we got to sit down and talk to him a little bit and understand his story. You see, he had, he had a big family, kids. I mean, I don't know. Was, he was an older gentleman, so there was like his, I don't know, his aunts or his sister. I mean, there's a lot of people, okay, in, in, this, in this group. His whole family was with him. And he stayed. I mean, the whole family just stayed. And, and I was drawn to this man. I was like, golly. Lord, why is he still here? Right? Because usually they'll, they'll come and they're excited and they say, well, we stay as long as you want. We just don't care. Stay, but you got to go when we got to go. We just don't care. Right? But he was there and he was just hanging out with his family. And I went and sat down with him and had this conversation with him. You see, this man was battling cancer and he was losing his battle. And he had nothing for his family. And he's worried. He's worried. Any leaders of the house here today wondering, I wonder what's going to happen to my family when I'm gone. This is real. There's no hope for him, right? Cancer's taken him. And he's sitting there and he's with his family. And I believe he's taking it all in. I don't think pride's that in because he's just like, I can't afford anything for my family. Here we are, we're eating in this house and we're giving gifts and he was coming towards the end of the day. And so I just said, hey, will you come outside with me for a minute? <laughs> it's almost like your dad actually, come here outside right now. <laughs> right, Brian comes with me. I think John was there. We had these gift cards, right? The gift cards that we were giving out. We had these gift cards in. We still had quite a handful. And then at first we we're like, you know, let's just give him like maybe eight or nine. And I said, come outside with me. He comes outside with me, right? And so you come outside here with like two, three, four other dudes. Don't even know us. We're like, hey man, because he's told me the story. I want to give you all these gift cards. He's like, okay. And I said, you know what, Brian, go get the rest. Brian went and got the rest of the gift cards. We had one more check left of $1,000. I give him that check for $1,000. All the presents on the table that were for the kids, we loaded them up with boxes and gave it to his family. And here we are. Cancer is battling this guy and is giving him no hope. But the thing was, hope was waiting for him at the depot. Hope met him at the depot. And we take these, these gifts and we're loading it in their car. The kids have no idea why we're doing this. And this man is broken. You remember? Yeah. He's crying. Why are you doing this? Because Jesus loves you. And Jesus sees you. But what about all the other people that need this? No. You need it. It's yours. There are going to be people who walk into the depot and they're going to be met by hope. And sometimes you are the only hope that anybody will receive because of who's in you. Right? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Some of you need to cry that out right now. Some of you have been crying it out for quite some time. But I promise you, oh, I promise you, my Lord and Savior Jesus, he stopped. He heard you. He sees you. You may be frustrated in your situation. You may be struggling in your situation. You may be wondering, where are you, God? That's where Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Where are you, God? Why are my kids the way that they are? Why is my family the way that they are? Why is my relationship the way they are with my spouse? Why can I find a job? Why can I keep a roof over my head? Why can I put food on the table? Why do I struggle with this addiction? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me! I promise you, he has stopped in his tracks. And he's actually at your door, knocking on the door. I'm right here, just open the door. Oh, I 
heard you. One of those crazy, what's crazy is, is that Jesus is trying to come in the door and we're doing this. Jesus, just come in the door. Come on, aren't we? Just push harder. <laughs> Do you not think that the creator of heaven and earth can just push you aside? <laughs> he won't come in until you invite him. You can open the door. He'll keep knocking. Just walk away from the door. Just walk away from the door. <laughs> I'll just come in. I'm ready. What do you want me to do for you? That's what he's saying. What do you want me to do for you? I want to see. You see your sight. Turn to your neighbor and say, there's hope. There's hope. So Father, we